Herzog went to Scotland to find the Loch Ness Monster. He never did find Nessie, but I still love an adventure, especially to unravel an urban legend. Today, video games are everywhere, so it might be hard to understand my generation's obsession with Atari. But for us, it was the gateway drug to a lifelong addiction to video games. And then one day, it was just gone. Sometime in the mid-80s, it just disappeared, and there were no more Atari games. And I always wondered what happened. Where did it go? So this is the famous landfill, the yep. burial, the final resting ground of E.T. Yeah, this is the place, uh, this, this road here, this gate, this is exactly the way the Ataris would have came through, through that ditch and up through here. It was the only access in. Back in those days, it was just pure desert. And is there any way to get through this, or are we, I mean... Oh, yeah, it's a high security stuck, gate, so... Stuck uh, under, yeah, I guess that works. <laughs> Joe Landowski has been the garbage guru, if you will, for, for a number of years. He operated various waste disposal companies within Alamogordo and Otero County. And when it comes to the Atari graveyard, I believe he probably has more direct knowledge than anybody else. Joe's the guy that's advising the city and telling the city where everything is. And I think that he's the only guy that might be able to walk out to that dump and point to a spot on the ground and say, this is where it's at. So, so this whole area, this is where it's buried? Some people don't believe it's there, but trust me, it's there. You can kind of feel it, right? Is that just me? Uh, it's pretty much you. It's just me. So what are these little boxes here? Each one of those boxes represent where garbage is. I see. Someone would write down, oh, that's where we put the Atari trash, that's where we put, you no, know. No, that's the problem. Nobody did. Uh, we do today. So yeah. it's looking for, it's like looking for a haystack in a pile of haystacks. Pretty much. And then looking for the needle inside that haystack. Inside the needle so it's inside. two levels. This picture here is actually out of an old El Paso Times article. This is actually that day and that event and when it actually occurred. So what we did is just to figure out, okay, if this reporter took this picture here, then the reporter had to be standing somewhere in this area. So here's the two cells that we pinned it down to now. So when you come back here, they put the reporter, take in the picture, and you make that line. And what you're looking for is to make sure the line intersects with the buildings. Joe Lewandowski wasn't just a guy who knew his way around a dump. He was also an amateur archeologist, kind of like Indiana Jones, but without the gun or the whip. See, the newspaper photo was like the medallion, and Joe had used it to construct his own version of the Staff of Ra, and that pinpointed the location of the Atari dump which is exactly how Indy would have done it. Joe was clearly obsessed. He believed in the legend. He'd spent over three years constructing a plan to dig up the landfill and prove it to the world. But he wasn't a gamer. He wasn't trying to find out why. And that's what I wanted to know. Why would the company I love so much decide to bury its future? The whole E.T. story is a very small part of the Atari story. Let me go back and explain how Atari started out. The video game came because of a convergence of me working at an amusement park summers while pursuing an engineering degree at the University of Utah. I knew the economics of the coin-operated game business. They made a lot of money. Nolan designed these incredibly elegant circuits, put together in a way that's so clever that you know modern engineers have a hard time uh, you know, understanding and repairing these things. My partner and I, Ted Dabney, started working on a ping pong game. By the end of 72, we did three and a half million dollars. And then we did 19 million, and then we did 35 million. It was a hockey stick. This electronic medium, which was just beginning, had some traction with people. And once you played some of the most sophisticated arcade games of the day and understood that maybe there was a chance you could duplicate that in a home game, your eyes got big. Home video games have been a success from the moment a company called Atari launched this basic game, Pong, which has been imitated by at least 40 other manufacturers. They're selling like crazy. 300,000 last year, this year 3 million. Next year, 6, maybe 10 million. We felt, well, maybe this is the time to sell to a company with deep pockets. I was in my office at Warner in 1976. The phone rang, and it was a guy named Gordy Crawford, and he asked the question I've never forgotten. Would you guys be interested in acquiring a technology-based, fast-growing entertainment company? And I said yes. I didn't know what I said yes to, but I said yes. And that led to my introduction to Atari. Atari, where the future comes from. What excited me about Atari wasn't Pong. It was the chipset that led to the Atari 2600. Pong was sort of okay, you bang up and back and up and back. But this meant you could constantly change the games, and that was a very exciting idea to me. We introduced the 2600 in 1977 with nine cartridges. The home video game was a very close approximation of the coin-op experience. It changed 
the mindset of the world. Turning the television from a passive medium into an active medium, that was what we knew we were doing, and that was super exciting to be the pioneers in that field. It just blew people away. Nobody knew any of this stuff. They made it up as they went, and they were good at it, and it started everything. It was playing those games that taught people the potential of a computer. Atari, at some level, brought the computer revolution. They started experimentally hiring smart kids with this idea that maybe they could come up with other stuff to do. And they inadvertently were trying to create the job of game designer. Microprocessor real-time control programming is just where it's at. So there's two kinds of things you could typically do with that in the early 1980s. You can do missile guidance systems, or like we say, kill people for 12 cents a head. Or you can make video games, which I thought was a much better application for the whole thing. What went on at Atari from the very beginning was basically that the engineers are going to drive this company because they weren't just engineers, they were creative guys. They're like musicians or movie directors. They're artists. Through luck or providence or both, they ended up with this department of game designers that became this dream team at Atari. These guys who made all of these classics, Tempest and Asteroids and Centipede and Gauntlet and, you know, think of a game. The culture was these guys do what they want to do. One day I was standing at the men's room at a urinal and I looked down and I saw a pair of bare feet next to me. And I looked and here's a guy wearing a pair of shorts and nothing else. And I said something, and they said, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. He's a great engineer. He doesn't like to wear clothes. The coin-op engineers at Atari, they were great. And on the consumer side, Howard was one of the best programmers. He was one of the best of those engineers. At the heart of the creative process is the programmer. I try to create basically a sensory experience that evokes a certain feeling in the user. I mean, I tend to program from a concept. I mean, it was, I was made for this. I mean, this was what I was made to do. January 11th, 1981, I showed up for my first day of work as a game programmer at Atari. So do you remember the first day you showed up here? Absolutely. My first office mates were Todd Fry and Rob Zadibble. And I had an understanding that there was a lot of dope that was smoked mm -hmm. at Atari when we were there. And so on my first day at work, I brought a joint because I didn't want to be, you know, yeah. uh, I wanted to be a courteous guest. And so I showed Which, up. By the way, this is a good lesson for our younger viewers. If people are doing drugs, bring your own so you fit in. Todd walks in, shuts the door, and says, I'm gonna get high in here, so if you don't wanna be around this, you better leave. No, actually, here, I said, I brought a joint. And he sort of looked at me and went, I'm gonna smoke some real stuff, okay? <laughs> that was my introduction. That was my first day at work. We wanted people who worked hard and yet had fun at doing it. How do we mix up so that we don't know the difference between our work and our play? The company's motto was, we take fun seriously, but we used to say, we take fun intravenously. And uh, they didn't like that very much. No, I, I don't know why. The party atmosphere was actually a calculated plan to incentivize. I would set quotas. If the quotas were met, I'd throw a kegger. They would just roll out in a car, go to a liquor store, and they gave someone a company credit card, and they came back with a bunch of booze, and we consumed it. Over there is where the hot tub was, inside on the first floor. There's some great stuff that went on in that room. Over here, here's the hill that, you know, one day I was wearing a dashiki shirt, which I was very into back then, and I would do somersaults down the hill. I might have had some cocktails that afternoon at that point. Did you know that you were entering this crazy party atmosphere that you'd be? No, even though I was told I was, I had no expectation that it could really exist. The best recruiting tool we could have for an engineer was to bring him over to one of our parties. Hey, what's happening? Hey, how's it going? How's it going? They felt, hey, I'm a nerd. There are girls here. They're talking to me. It's good. That was the culture. These guys are the lifeblood of the business. They do what they want to do, and that's fine. In some ways, things happened to me over the course of three and a half years here that made the next 25 years really tough because it established a standard of what professional life and life in general could be. And I never let go of the thought that my life could still be this or better. I just didn't know how to do it. It's really intense for me to come back here. This is the first time I've been back here in 30 years. And this was the place where I was introduced to what life could be for me what a working life could be, what real creative satisfaction could be, what doing something really meaningful could be. Those are all things that come back to me in this moment. And it's just it's very intense. So what really happened back in 1983? People heard the rumors, but Atari denied the dump ever took place. 
and eventually people forgot about it. But with the growth of the internet and all of its best and worst lists, E.T. and its burial went from small town gossip to full-blown urban legend. By the mid-90s, videos began to appear online that seemed to suggest that anyone with a shovel could go out in the desert and dig up the buried games. That's what I thought too, but it wasn't close to that easy. Joe had spent years researching the burial. If his information was correct, the games were not only deep underground, they were covered with concrete. Joe was still wading through a sea of red tape, but if and when the city approved his plan to excavate the landfill, he was gonna need more than just a shovel. He would need giant yellow digging machines and a bunch of guys in hats and vests to operate them. This is uh, one of the photos of the actual burial when they did it. So we're looking at like 15 feet down to hit the concrete. Under the concrete, it's mostly dirt. It's just a, it's the bottom of the pit. What's that thing right over there? That's a motor grader. A motor grader? Yes. That's for really just fine grading, you know, like the highways and roads and fine planing large areas. So we conceivably might need that for this, right? No, no. I mean, but you might, you could, you could bring it out before, right? I mean, you might want to park it there so it's ready. No, not really. No, no, no we're fine. Right. I don't know, not my field. I am concerned that Joe's moving kind of quick and we do need to throw some brakes on and slow it down. The opposition comes from um, environmentalists maybe within the community. And the concern is, is that Alamogordo also may have something else buried in the landfill that may be hazardous. And we may not know exactly where this location is. Nobody really and truly has dead honest records as to where everything is buried out there. And, and we're talking potential mercury-laced pigs, malathion, possibly DDT. There's potentially lead in there, maybe some other dangerous metals that are in those cartridges. I don't want to be in an area where we might crack open a sealed tomb, so to speak, of these hogs where mercury gas comes out. So I don't want the Stephen King novel over we hit the wrong spot and all of a sudden we are evacuating Alamogordo. That is unacceptable to me. If there's a problem that the New Mexico Environmental Department perceives, we're not going to be able to proceed. Until I'm satisfied it's safe, it's not going to happen, at least within my power. I, you know, there's only so much power that I have. So for my first game, they wanted me to do a coin-op conversion. Although I had only been there for about a week, I went to my manager and I said, you know something? I said, this game, Star Castle on the 2600 is just going to suck. I know it's going to suck. And I said, but I think I can take some of the key things that I think make it a fun game and rework it so that it would work on the 2600. And so they said, OK, go ahead, do what you want to do. So how did you learn how to program a game? I just read the manual and started writing the game. No one had ever done like a backstory for a game before. And I thought this is my first game and I want to be involved in every part of it. I want to make it the best thing it could possibly be. So I wrote this like seven, eight page story. I stayed up all night just writing this story, knocked it out. And it was a science fiction story about flies that get on the first interstellar spaceships and mutate and evolve and take over the solar system. But now they're under attack by this other monster and stuff. And that's in short version of the story. So I thought, well, I need to name it. So what I did was I named it Yar because that's Ray spelled backwards, and Ray Kazar was the CEO of Atari, right? So I've got his name keyed into the title, and I thought Revenge, great action word, you know, so that's compelling. And so that's how it became Yar's Revenge. When Yar's Revenge came out, it was a it was a hit. It was huge. Games that could look like Yar's Revenge looked, that could draw that kind of stuff, were like magical. Even though Yar's Revenge might look primitive, you know, it looks like the superconducting super collider compared to a lot of the games that were out there at the time. Uh, I remember the first time I put the cartridge, and I was like, "What is this? It really is a very innovative shooter of that era." Getting a ship to fly around, so it's fun just to fly the ship around, is a trick, especially on that hardware. The enemy was cool and scary, and it felt really good to defeat it. You feel like it's your victory when you beat those challenges, and you. You feel like it's your defeat when they beat you and you will keep coming back because you didn't lose by being cheated you didn't lose because the game did something unfair you lost because you weren't quite good enough and all of the great games sit right on that edge i remember playing yard revenge one day and we happened on this trick that let you if you were on this right spot at the right time in the game and it was in between levels these initials came up the initials were hsw to us it was some weird mystery like we had to figure out what hsw meant and finally in one of the game magazines they published what hsw meant turns out hsw means howard scott warshaw the guy who made the game yours revenge was the first game that atari ever did where the programmer's name went out with the cartridge yours revenge had a lot of firsts and that was just one of them Yard's Revenge is the best-selling original game for the Atari 2600. It sold something like a million copies. Every reviewer at the time thought Yard's Revenge was one of the best games Atari put out. You know it made a lot of money for Atari. 
in 1981, this is a company that made operating profits of something like $375 million. One of today's greatest marketing triumphs in the entertainment field is video games. It's a business it was beyond comprehension, the fastest growing company in American history. This was an explosion. Even those of us who were in the middle of it were shaking our heads going, oh my God, this is amazing. We were the most successful coin-op company. We were the dominant consumer company. And we sat around literally saying to ourselves, what are the categories of games? What are the capabilities of the 20th century? Where is this industry going? Everything that Joe has put together on this Atari graveyard so far seems to be coming true. I'm in favor of the Atari games being dug up because it is the largest myth in the gaming world. I believe that Joe just thinks it'd be an outstanding event for Alamogordo and a way to get us on the map. On Tuesday, Almogordo's city commission approved a deal to dig in the old landfill within the next six months. The city has given its okay, and now the state has given them approval. Film crews will be in Alamogordo. The documentary film crew will start probing the dump for their strange buried treasure at 9.30 a.m. So this is an impressive looking machine out here. What the hell is it doing? What this drilling rig does goes down, straight down, takes out core samples, and brings up whatever's in the ground. We've narrowed it down from 300 acres down to about 5 to 10 acres. And so what we're doing now is trying to get it even closer. Because we're looking for things like somebody's mail, you know, the postmarks, uh, newspapers, things like that, looking for dates. So we're looking for September of 83. Don't you think people are going to be disappointed if we dig it up and we don't actually find the ET games? I mean, wouldn't that be? That'd be very disappointing for every, all of us. All the work, three years of work put into this. So what do we do then? You're just going to dig up the whole landfill or something? No, we can't. The environment department will not allow that to happen. You're saying that there's a possibility that this could turn out to be a giant waste of time. I think I said it before. I'll bet the car. I won't bet the house. Most everybody, is, at least in the Western world, has played a video game of some kind. They've gone to an arcade. They know the Atari brand. They certainly know E.T. And so I think there's a universal curiosity about this game. You know, something did happen those couple of nights in 1983 that I, I think it merits a serious investigation. So why did I decide to go to Alamogordo? I'm very much interested in the impact that a particular game or an industry has made within a cultural and social context. What's striking about the Atari ET game in the Alamogordo landfill is that they're there and not in museums. I think this is what excites many people who keep this narrative alive, is they want to get these items. They want visible proof. They want some kind of tangible evidence that that dump did take place. I've been professionally making games since about 94, but more than that, I'm, a, I'm somebody who's been chiefly doing a lot of historical work with video games, trying to preserve video games and get people to understand that video games are more like art. And so I've been doing a lot of video game preservation and education. I always thought one day I'm going to go over there and I'm going to see finally once and for all like where it's buried. I almost don't even really need to know what's in it. I almost want to keep that mystery alive. To me, under that landfill is actually the burial site of an entire industry because what affected Atari at the time affected everyone. And everything that I thought was going to go on forever stopped. And it stopped almost at that same moment that these Whatever's there was buried. So for me, I want to find out what the, what's, what is there. It's like opening the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> it's like, you kind of want to look, but is my face going to melt off? I don't know. I have told my wife that I will be going to New Mexico. And she asked me why. And I started to explain. And she said, I don't, I don't need to know. <laughs> you just go do it. <laughs> You want it Ernest on screen? Uh, whatever. Ernest is my fancy writer name. Ernie is what everybody calls well, actually, me. All right, so we'll use your writer's name. How would you describe yourself? Uh, screenwriter, novelist. Gentleman adventurer. The thing about having an Atari for me was it was a simulator. Like I could simulate being an Anna Jones or simulate being E.T. <laughs> having access to that and coming from a family of like modest means and not having to, you know, beg for quarters and just be able to play as much as you wanted, that was such a huge part of my childhood and fed my imagination. And that was the inspiration for uh, Ready Player One, my novel. The idea of like what if Willy Wonka had been a video game designer and he held his golden ticket contest inside his greatest video game creation. And that all came from finding those Easter eggs in all those Atari games. I felt like a little kid this past week, like getting ready to go to camp. Alamogordo and the Atari graveyard, for me, it's like holy ground. And that was when I realized my DeLorean's already in New Mexico. I just have to fly to Santa Fe, pick up my DeLorean from George R. R. Martin, who was using it for the Back to the Future screening, and drive it down to Alamogordo. I could stop at the very large array, also hit Roswell, and then go to Alamogordo and be there for the excavation of the Atari graveyard. As soon as those, you know, tumblers clicked into place, I'm like, the most epic road trip of all time, I have to go. It's like I'm Indy going to Westeros to meet Doc Brown and then save the team.
boom. Uh, have a great drive and a great time in that. Uh, George, thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. It's my pleasure. This is a good piece of evidence because right here. Is that the date right there? Right there. You got Sunday, October 2nd, 1983 right there. That's good, right? Yeah, Atari was from the 23rd to the 29th of September. So this is like a week later. Well, it's not even a week. It's like two or three days later. Well, I'm not that good at math. The Ataris would have been on the bottom, then garbage from the following weeks would have been piled on top. Right. So where are the this games? This is the following week. In here. No games yet. No Atari stuff at all? No, not yet. Not yet. OK. I love the challenges. I love the mystery. I love the, the especially when people say they'll never be found or they're not there, that just makes the challenge even better. I put three to four years of this research, planning, the, the politics, the environment department, I mean, many, many, many things to get to this point. Yeah, now it's very important that we find them. So back in the early 80s, movie licenses for video games were just starting to come into vogue, and I think Raiders was the first one. So they needed someone to do Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think what happened was Yars was very successful, and so they wanted me to do a big game. And then it was up to Spielberg. So when I went down and met with Spielberg, and if Spielberg would have said, you know, I don't think he's really right for the game, they would have sent someone else. Can Indiana Jones escape from the forces of evil? In Atari's Raiders of the Lost Ark adventure game. What was the reception of the Raiders of the Lost Ark game? It was another million seller. Raiders was huge. I mean, I can honestly say I'm the only programmer in the history of Atari where every one of my games that was released was a million seller. The word meteoric comes to mind. And now, Steven Spielberg brings us E.T., the extraterrestrial. Spielberg says, well, you know, my pictures, they open slow, and uh, they build, and they hold, and da 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 And I just looked at him, and I didn't know anything. I said, not this one, it was E.T. I said, it's going to open huge, and it's going to stay huge. Okay, the movie comes out, it's a huge hit, and we want to do the cartridge of it, okay? You know, every time you try to take some kind of a property and move it into another medium for a pure profit motive, you get trouble. Specifically, with respect to games, you know, it's like, oh, you know, like, let's go see if we can exploit this movie as a game. You know, maybe we could make extra money out of a profitable franchise. Now, there is a negotiation going on between the Atari people and the people at Universal about what we're gonna pay, and Steve Ross, who was the CEO of Warner, got in, and for whatever the reasons, he agrees to a deal that is so off the chart, nobody believes it. But he does it. It was 20 to $30 million. It was some crazy number. Steve Ross basically was trying to wound Steven Spielberg to come to work for Warner because he recognized that Spielberg was a genius. And that all plays into this story, where we, we acquired the rights to E.T., and it was, we had to have the game out for Christmas. And that's a problem. One afternoon, I'm sitting in my office, and a call comes in, and it's Ray Kazar, and he's calling from Monterey. So I take a call, and Ray Kazar comes on the phone, and he says, Howard, can you do E.T. in five weeks? And I said, yes, I can. And he goes, OK, in two days, I want you to be at San Jose Executive Airport. There'll be a Learjet waiting for you. Be on that jet. Be ready to propose the game to Spielberg. During that meeting, when I flew down on the Learjet to go meet Spielberg and present the game to him, even though I only had five weeks, I still wanted to innovate. So I proposed a 3D world that the game was going to take place on. And the huge scope of what I was trying to achieve, it walks that line between really trying to make something happen and venturing into the impossible and walking off a cliff. The emotionality of the game was supposed to come out through the interaction of the characters. You have the FBI agent who's interested in what you have. That's why the FBI agent just steals stuff that you were holding. You have the scientist who's interested in who you are. The scientist actually carries you back to the city because they want to study you. And Elliot comes in to save you. There's times where you can call Elliot and he will help you out. And so those are the kind of things that I had that I thought created possibly some sentiment. But, And at one point, Spielberg says to me, he goes, you know, couldn't you do something more like Pac-Man? No, Stephen, we need to do a game that's fresh. We need to do something that's really worthy of this not movie. It's how simple you can make a complicated game. It's how complicated a game can you make subject to the constraint of easy learnability. My job is to produce a cartridge that is going to sell for its art. A typical VCS game at the time took five or six months, and this was going to be in five weeks. You might think, no, nobody can do a game in five weeks, like most people in the department would think. 
But I don't think that way. I think, yeah, I can do that. The word hubris comes to mind. I mean, whatever it is I might have been full of, I was overflowing with it at that point. Because if the game can't make the Christmas market, the game is a total waste. They're going to miss their window. So that was the big thing. It was the uh, $22 million bet that you could turn the game around in that time. I had a development station moved into my home. So I could be basically working on this game almost 24 hours. We found that there was a good probability of success if we took a coin-operated game and just ported it over to a game that we could play on the PCS. E.T. didn't have that. Hello? Somebody out there? <laughs> It's the video game that lets you pretend you're E.T. Okay, so the game's done, and one of the conditions I asked for was that Steven Spielberg is the one who approves the final game. So Steven Spielberg played the final game and approved it for release. Howard, who is a, uh, a certifiable uh, uh, genius, went off and about a number of weeks later came back with a concept and a uh, game plan. And I, was, I was amazed at how difficult it was, and yet at the same time how much fun it was to play. Have you seen the latest update? I've seen the final game. Are you happy with it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's my favorite. Of course, I'm biased. I made the movie. <laughs> so Steven Spielberg thought it was okay, so I thought, all right, I'm good with that. And uh, not that I'm blaming him for anything. No, of course not. But, uh, but it's his fault. The video game that lets you help E.T. get home, just in time for Christmas. After E.T. was released, there was a great sense of relief that we'd actually made the schedule and everything was good. And then the game went out into market and it was very high on the billboard list. And again, things were good. I got E.T., I think it was Christmas of 1982, if I remember correctly, and I thought it was, like, I was going to be the guy on the street who had E.T. before everybody else. Turns out everybody I knew got E.T. that Christmas. After a while, people start going by me in the halls, people from other buildings, people from marketing and management, and they're saying things like, you know, you know something, Howard? You did a great job. We don't blame you. That was really something what you did. You really came through for us there, and we don't want you to think we think anything else. This really isn't about you. Don't feel bad. It's okay. It's cool. And I'm thinking, like, what the hell are they talking about? E.T. was a really hard game. It was the kind of game that um, was brutal, unfair, uh, didn't make a lot of sense. I grew up in, in London, and there was a video game store in my town that uh, let you rent them. I don't know what the rental was, like 50 pence for a weekend, but I still remember feeling like I wasted my money because it just, it was bad. People aren't liking it, and people aren't liking it a lot. And what made it particularly bad was my memory of the movie was so great. I love the movie. Everyone loved the movie when it came out. It's a great movie, still is, is a classic movie today. And so this massive chasm that existed between the quality of the movie and the quality of the game that it was based on, I think just made it seem that much more like a slap in the face. Okay, well, maybe it won't sell six million. Maybe it'll only sell four million or three million. That'll be okay. And then there's like returns. People are returning the game. They made too many. How many they made? I don't even know. They made like four million cartridges. That means there could be millions of cards coming back. So what do you do with useless, worthless product, how do you get rid of it? Bury it. That's a pretty good answer. Well, career change is not anything new for me. I've been through a number of different careers. I actually went and got a uh, California real estate license and then a broker's license and did that for a while. And I did that just long enough to know this was like the last thing in the world I wanted to do. And now I am a licensed practicing psychotherapist in California. And I'm a very unique therapist in that I have a master's of engineering and I also have a master of arts in counseling psychology. I mean, I'm the Silicon Valley therapist. I'm very good at translating between English and nerd. And this is the first time since I left Atari that I feel I'm doing what I really love doing. So it took me 30 years to get back to a place that I don't feel I'm a step down from where I used to work. And that's many, many different jobs. I know this dig is coming up, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to be standing right there. And I am going to literally watch my past being dug up. And that's a weird kind of thing to anticipate. My hopes are in one way, my expectations are another, and I don't know what it's going to be. I really don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what it's going to mean to me when, if something comes up, if it's there.
part of punk archaeology is that sense of community, and the fact that we're helping each other out um, to address the issues that we're interested in. And uh, most of the time we're doing it uh, on a volunteer basis. It's going to be interesting to see how they decide to excavate in order to clear a better area, you know, so that we can get at more of the content that we need. One of the people <laughs> down there did confirm finding a Donnie Marie poster. Yeah, yeah, which, which is awesome. That's well, basically, because we're going to treat this as a salvage excavation, we will dig a trench. We'll go through and excavate the material in the pits that we dig, at which point we'll send them up to the tables. We'll sort through the material, we'll weigh it, we'll count it, identify it, and, uh, yeah, that's the plan. So what's happened so far today? Uh, basically, we've started digging on the hole, and the trucks have already started going through the train. So just so people understand, and probably right now I'm cutting to an awesome diagram of this, there's like 20 feet of garbage that's on the top of wherever the games are buried. Garbage and dirt. Sorry, garbage and dirt. Right. Um, in the diagram, it's going to be pretty clear. And so that all has to be taken away, right? Yeah, we'll get the vast majority of the hole excavated out. And so far, have we found anything? Found any Atari games? Or... No, nothing. Nothing. Nothing yet. And, and son, I mean, you seem pretty nervous. Right. Are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Terrified. Terrified. OK. Um, I got to be honest, I'm nervous as shit. I don't know if that'll help motivate you guys, but. Um, yeah, that did it for us. Yeah. Yeah. We, right. need, we need to get back to work, yeah. Great, let's go. <laughs> Not you're done go that, team. Let it go. <laughs> Son, calm down, buddy. <laughs>
for the Atari 2600 was the worst video game of all time. It would be so great to debunk that because it's it's just not true. And also to redeem Howard Scott Warshaw because he's an amazing video game designer and his game was great. <laughs> cool car. Yeah, I like that. ET's in there. This morning coming to a dump in a small town in New Mexico, there were people lined up waiting to get in. What's the last time you saw a line of people waiting to get into a dump? It totally took me by surprise, but in a delightful way. You never go to a dump unless you're throwing something away. And here we are trying to find treasure, buried treasure. I think they'll find something. And the cartridges had to go somewhere. Why not here? There is a lot of open space. Great place to dump a million cartridges. There is a definite possibility that there is games. This is archaeology for the time I grew up. So the nostalgia for anything that came out of that era is pretty high. All right, now the wind is really picking up. On cue. On cue. Yeah. The weather here in Alamogordo is awesome. If you like sandstorms and an impending doom-filled cloud of white. Whoa. Oh, this is getting brutal. Yeah. Sorry, this, this is brutal. It's getting very windy. Basically what's happening is the white sands are blowing in from white sands and uh, covering everything and it's really shitty. Well, They're saying this is like a historic wind really? today. That's what somebody told us. Yeah. To think that we're in the middle of a sandstorm, really, this is what's going on. And for me, it was almost like the big sandstorm, right? The opening of Close Encounters, and the people wearing the goggles and the bandanas. Everybody's like gathered around because they found something and they, they can't believe what they found. Oh, we're the first! This is Tony Johnson from Denver, Colorado, who ran up to me at my DeLorean. He's like, I found something, I found something. And Tony is going to go down in his feet because he found the first evidence of Atari whoa, hardware. Whoa, whoa, that's right there. Right there it is, my man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have an, an announcement. So, Tony, tell us what you just found. Uh, an Atari 2600 joystick top. <laughs> so, Tony, where did you find it? Walking to the bathroom. <laughs> So is it surface find? Surface, surface, surface find. Surface find. Okay. Yeah, like we know what a surface find is, right? Well, surface find is uh, something that, you know, you're walking around, you're looking down on the ground, you see something interesting, you pick it up. It's totally out of archaeological context. What are the odds that that, like, blew out of the hole? I actually think that's pretty good. I mean, the wind is blowing fiercely in that direction. You know, the stuff's coming out of the bucket. You know, we've been finding a lot of interesting things that date from around that time. Anything from Atari? Uh, nothing from Atari yet. How can you authenticate this? Can you carbon date it? <laughs> no, it's, it's much too recent for that. <laughs> There are really two things that we could be dealing with when taking a look at these cartridges if they're actually there. First thing is that they just loaded the trucks with these cartridges and then they dumped them. And that's the best possible scenario because you can pull them out and I bet you most of them would be playable. You know, they've just been in there for, you know, since 1983. Trash bags, Stroh's beer cans, wood, tons of wood. We're right about where we need to be, but there's still no Atari detritus at all. We've been here for a while already. It's tedious, the wind's horrible. We're wondering if they're going to find anything or not. It's uh, like a nylon cord uh, and a big red wrapper. I don't think there's anything in that hole except rattlesnakes and scorpions. If it's buried, it's probably for a reason. It should stay buried. I wasn't thinking that something was really messed up until late 83. To me, Atari was never going to go away. It was this thing that was just part of my life. And the thought that there could ever be a day where there was no Atari or no Atari 2600 uh, never crossed my mind. E.T. comes out, and E.T. is not so great. And somewhere toward the end of the year, I'm starting to wonder, are we making our numbers? Which leads to one of the worst nights of my life. On December 7th, 1982, I get a call from Dennis Groth, who was the CFO of Atari, and he says, Manny, here's the new budget and it's a huge shortfall from what we had been told. Warner Communications said today that its once booming Atari business lost another $180 million in the third quarter for total losses this year of more than half a billion dollars. I was starting to see enough signs in the company that things were starting to unravel. It was unraveling hard and fast, and we didn't have any ready solutions. Several Atari executives, including Atari's chairman, Raymond Kassar, sold Warner stock shortly before the negative earnings announcement and the decline in the price of the stock. Kassar denies any wrongdoing or impropriety, but a number of stockholders have sued Warner. So they got rid of Ray Kassar and they brought in a guy from Philip Morris, and when he came in, Atari had 10,000 employees, and within about four months or five months, Atari had 2,000 employees. I really got that we had lost 80% of our staff. In the short run, the market is frequently irrational. In the longer run, hopefully it's rational. The wild upside ride was over. I did not understand 
the extent of the downside ride that was coming. This is slipping away. The train is derailing. It's not gonna keep riding, and what am I gonna do next? It was a big emotional blow. It was my baby, and I hated to see it abused. New Media Magazine credited E.T. with destroying the video game industry. That's interesting. I think that's really interesting that I could be single-handedly responsible for toppling a billion-dollar industry. E.T. comes out, the industry dies, Howard's associated with that, and I think that's, that's affected his career and what people will remember him for, and that's, that's pretty bad. The fact that a guy's career got destroyed because he did E.T., given the circumstances surrounding doing E.T., is it's completely unfair. I mean, it's sad. It's really sad. There's this video game, Walk of Fame. There's also this show called Dice, where they give out Lifetime Achievement Awards. Howard's not in that. He's not, he's not put in that same group. They kind of keep him out of all these things, and it's, it's kind of a shame. The day I left Atari, when things really fell apart and it was over and I'm literally carrying my garbage out to my car to leave for the last time, that was a very depressing moment for me because I felt I was losing the most important thing in my life. And I, I also knew it was so unreal that I'd never be able to recreate it. The burial in Almogordo is basically Atari's funeral. The burial of those cartridges represents the burial of that beautiful era. And that may be what's interesting about it. I don't know. I mean, that's a whole psychology I'm not going to go near. But, but it may be because it is about the, the death of Atari. That's what it is. We can't control how the past returns to us. We may get something that no longer resembles an ET cartridge. We may get something monstrous, something twisted, something decayed. We may not even know what we're looking at if we unearth Atari's ET. Part of me feels that when you finally crack open this place and you start to look, it's going to be a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. It's just going to be a bunch of sand. But another part of me hopes that what's found there is going to lead to a lot more understanding and a lot more discovery about what, what really happened. Shit, you see what I see? What's his name? Joe! Joe! What's that? What is that right there? They want me to come in? Let's go. So what's up? You guys find something? I should have brought my binoculars. Can you show me? They're bringing some stuff over to the archaeologist table right now. Let's see what's going on. Can everybody hear me? We found something. Uh, the archaeologists have confirmed it's from 1983, 28 feet down. It's E.T. the video game, intact, in its box. It's an emotional, emotional event. They backed up this legend with fact, and it's incredible to be a part of it. Doctor. I wasn't nervous till we got down to that where he was almost reaching his max land. But yeah, it was a big weight off my shoulders when, when that, that bucket came up there. And ET was there too. Congratulations, dude. Thank you. I didn't think you were going to find him intact. I thought for sure they'd be crushed and ruined. But now I got goosebumps. And it's not because of the dust storm. What's this moment like for you? Look at all the excitement that's been generated today over something I did 32 years ago. It just. It's an immensely personal thing. What it took to make these games was a lot. And this one was done in five weeks. That was one of the hardest five weeks of my life. So I need a little moment. And I'm just so excited to be here. A lot of these people who were complaining about E.T. had never actually even played it. And I, ever since then, I would talk to people, and they would talk about E.T., and I'm like, well, have you, have you ever played the game? And it would come out that they didn't. They would just kind of continue this myth of the game being really horrible. It is a good game. It wasn't the worst that Atari had to offer. They were, like, I remember getting a game called Firefly. That is the worst game for Atari. That's what everybody should be focusing their efforts on, not E.T. Let me be clear, the worst game ever made was obviously Trespasser. <laughs> So I just want to be clear with that. With the shitload of just horrible, poorly made, cranked out Atari games, to call E.T. 
The worst one is just sh shameful. In contemporary game culture, we like trashing games. I don't mean putting them in landfills, but verbally, trashing game design. It's become fashionable to sort of regard E.T. as the worst video game of all time. In fact, it makes everybody's list as the number one. And I'm going to go out on a complete limb here and say, and maybe people will attack me for this, but I'd rather play Atari's E.T. than any Call of Duty. You know, in context, given the time and the situation that Howard had to live in to program that game, it really is an astonishing masterwork. He made an amazing fucking game that's a whole self-contained world in five weeks. That's even more impressive. I don't know any human being who could have turned E.T. in the time frames involved into a really successful game. He should be applauded for being able to have done anything in the time that was allotted. The scorn should be heaped upon those who thought that it was even rational to try to build a cartridge in a month and a half. The analogy that people always use for these first timers, for people who try something first, uh, is the first penguin analogy, where the first penguin who jumps down the hole through the ice is the one who invariably gets eaten by the seal. But if there wasn't a first penguin, then the penguins would be going down through the ice. So, sucks to be the first penguin, but somebody's gotta do it. So it turned out that Joe Lewandowski had been right all along. The games were buried almost exactly where he had predicted, and no mercury-filled pigs popped up out of the ground. So the legend of the burial was true. Or was it? When the archaeologists cataloged all the games, there were a bunch of E.T. cartridges, but nowhere near the millions that were such a big part of the legend. In fact, E.T. made up about 10% of the total games found. The rest included some of the best games ever made, Defender and Centipede and Yar's Revenge. There was even one copy of Adventure, which I snagged. The burial wasn't a cover-up or done out of shame. It was a warehouse dump done by a company in financial distress. At the time, the Almogordo landfill was just the most practical solution. E.T. wasn't buried because it was the worst game ever. People called it the worst game ever because it had been buried. And as a result, it got blamed for destroying an entire industry. The game and its creator had taken the rap for a crime they didn't commit. The notion that E.T. caused the demise of Atari is simply stupid. It's just stupid. Atari committed suicide. It was not homicide. And it wasn't the E.T. cartridge. It was a concomitant effect of a lot of missteps in technology, in deployment, in marketing. So people say E.T. destroyed the video game industry. I'm sure I've heard that before, but it's just really funny. No, the behavior pattern that created the conditions for the E.T. failure is what 